All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Primetime Alive program on understanding neuropathy. Our presenter today is Dr. Samira Ramich. Um, I'm Vicki Newell with the Primetime Alive program. As you can see, I was wearing a mask. Um, at the hospital, we do wear them, um, especially in public places. Um, but if we can maintain at least a six foot social distance, we can take them off since we're in a very large auditorium with just two of us today. Just so you can understand us better, we will not be wearing masks. All right, to submit a question today, um, we will not get to those to the end of the presentation. Um, if you're top right hand corner, so up in an area about here, you should have an, a red arrow or something you can click. It will open it up and then you can see a box like this. The way bottom there should be enter a question for staff, for the staff. Um, type in your question, hit send. It'll be put into our queue and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Dr. Ramich. Dr. Ramich received her bachelor's degree from Grandview University and her medical degree from Des Moines University. She completed a residency in adult neurology from the University of Pittsburgh and a fellowship in neuromuscular medicine from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Ramich joined McFarland Clinic Neurology in October of 2018. Please welcome Dr. Samira Ramich. Thank you, Vicki. Okay, so we will get started. I was asked today to discuss the topic of polyneuropathy. It's a very interesting subject. I see a lot of patients. It's a very common problem, especially as we get older. So we're going to have a lot of good information here, and I'll be happy to answer some questions at the end. So we'll get started right away here. Okay, so what is polyneuropathy? The definition is that it is a general degeneration of peripheral nerves toward the center of the body. We'll talk a little bit later about different types of neuropathies where the degeneration of the peripheral nerves happens in a different pattern, but this is the big, broad definition. As I mentioned earlier, polyneuropathy is quite uh, a common problem. It affects about 2.4% 2, 2 of the population, and as we get older, the prevalence increases to nearly 8%. Diabetics are at particularly higher risk to develop polyneuropathy, and type 1 diabetics um, tend to have a 66% um, prevalence of neuropathy, while type 2 diabetics a little bit lower at 59%. There are various types of neuropathies, which we will talk about a bit, but the most common inherited neuropathy is something called Charcot-Marie Tooth, type 1A. It is named after the doctors that describe this disease, and it affects about 30 in 100,000 individuals. Another common thing is carpal tunnel syndrome. This is actually a neuropathy, a mononeuropathy affecting a single nerve, and it affects about 3 to 5% of adults. So here's a bit of an overview. We will review the symptoms of polyneuropathy. We'll go over a brief anatomy of nerve fibers. We'll talk about the types of polyneuropathies, the causes. We'll spend a little bit of time just talking about diabetic polyneuropathy because, as I mentioned, it is so common and it affects so many individuals. We'll talk about the various evaluations that occur when somebody is being diagnosed with polyneuropathy. There are some treatment options to discuss, and at the very end, I have a few cases for you guys that we could review. So, signs and symptoms. There are different types of symptoms that can occur as a result of polyneuropathy, and we can separate those into two different categories, positive and negative symptoms. If you think about positive symptoms as something being added, that's one way to remember it, and negative symptoms as something being taken away. 
So positive symptoms can consist of burning, prickling, tingling, sharp shooting pain. Allodynia is a term used to describe painful um, pain in with a stimulus that isn't supposed to be painful. So I have some patients describe that at night, the sheets touching their feet can be very uncomfortable. It can cause them to have a sh shooting kind of discomfort, and that would be described as an allodynia. Negative symptoms consist of numbness, so losing sensation, uh, imbalance, and gait dysfunction, having falls because you're not able to feel your feet and where they are in space. These are all negative symptoms. And try to remember this. I'll talk to you guys later in the treatment section about um, positive and negative symptoms because some of these symptoms are not um, easily treated. So I found this really nice chart of different symptoms that one can experience as a result of polyneuropathy. And over here, sensory nerve damage can cause unusual sensations. So like I talked about, sharp kind of shooting, prickling pains, um, pain from a light touch. So that can be described as allodynia because that isn't supposed to be painful, but your nerves are appreciating pain with a non-painful stimulus. A burning type of discomfort, tingling, balance problem, numbness, these can all happen when the sensory nerves are not feeling what they're supposed to feel. Motor nerves can also be damaged, and so patients can experience muscle cramping, twitching, abnormal reflexes as a result of polyneuropathy. Um, sometimes, and this, this is a different topic, but a lot of patients with peripheral neuropathy can experience restless leg symptoms as well. Autonomic nerve damage. So this is, um, in addition to nerves that help us appreciate sensation and nerves that help supply the muscles of our bodies, we have a nervous system that's responsible for the automatic functions in our body. So breathing, heartbeat, um, gut motility, all these things, sweating, things that we don't think about that are automatically happening in our body. But that nervous system can also be affected and therefore patients can experience autonomic dysfunction. So heat intolerance, excess sweating, and that happens because their thermal regulation is affected. Um, they can get full too quickly while eating, and some can even vomit. This is seen in something called gastroparesis. Impotence um, can occur as a result of polyneuropathy and orthostatic hypotension. So standing up, your blood vessels don't pump that blood up back to your heart and your brain, and you can get very faint and lightheaded, and in extreme cases, patients can have fainting or near fainting sensation. So we'll go next to the anatomy of um, the nerves. So a nerve fiber is the basic unit of communication in the nervous system um, in the nerve cell, which is also called a neuron. Each nerve cell consists of a cell body, which is right here, a nucleus, which is within the cell body, Small branching fibers are called the dendrites, and they are the ones that typically receive messages to that neuron. And then the myelin sheath um, that covers the axon, which sends messages away from that neuron. This myelin sheath here covering that axon is a fatty material that protects the nerves of the brain and the spinal cord. So a little bit more about axons and myelin because it does come into play with neuropathy and the different causes of neuropathies. But the myelinated axon can be likened to an electrical wire, 
which is the axon itself, and the insulating material around that electrical wire, which would be the myelin, that fatty protective cover. Unlike the plastic covering on an electrical wire, the myelin does not form a single long sheath over the entire length of the axons. Rather, multiple little cells, um, they're called Schwann cells, cover a single axon as it travels down its path. There are various types of nerve fibers, and that is important as well in helping us determine what kind of um, nerve fibers are involved. This can, um, these clues can be given by what types of symptoms people experience. So an A alpha nerve fiber carries information related to proprioception or muscle sense. This is knowing basically where your feet are in space, where your toes are in space, and it can cause um, imbalance or ambulatory dysfunction if these nerves are damaged. A beta nerve fibers carry information related to touch. A delta nerve fibers carry information related to pain and temperature. And C nerve fibers carry information related to pain, temperature, and itch. So as you can see, these A alpha nerve fibers have the thickest myelin around them. And they themselves, the red portion here, they themselves are the thickest axons. So the thickness and the diameter of axon and the amount of myelin around a nerve fiber directly correlates with how fast those messages can be sent. So this A alpha nerve fiber sends signals much faster than C nerve fibers. So here's a little bit of breakdown between larger and smaller nerve fibers. Again, the myelinated, the thick nerve fibers are the fastest. The unmyelinated ones are very slow. The clinical features for large nerve fibers include weakness, muscle wasting, shrinking. While smaller nerve fibers, um, if damaged, cause pain, autonomic dysfunction, or temperature, um, appreciation abnormalities. On exam, large nerve fiber neuropathies reveal impaired vibration sense, loss of joint position sense or that proprioception that we talked about earlier, and loss of reflexes. I apologize, that's not supposed to say loser. <laughs> loss of reflexes. Smaller nerve fibers, when damaged, can cause impaired pain sensation. So when your doctor examines you, you may notice that um, you don't appreciate a pinprick distally in your feet. Um, and some of you who have diabetes might be familiar with that monofilament test that your doctors do where they take a small, fibrous, um, bendable, prickly uh, little tool against your feet to see if you can appreciate that. So if small nerve fibers are damaged, you would have impaired sensation to that. Temperature, so feeling hot versus cold and being able to discern the two can also be affected. And um, if only the small nerve fibers are damaged, your strength and reflexes remain normal. Electrodiagnostic testing, which we will talk a little bit about later, is uh, tends to be abnormal when large nerve fibers are damaged, but it, it is normal with smaller nerve fibers, and that is because we are unable to test the small nerve fiber function with the conventional electrodiagnostic testing, although there are ways to test the small nerve fiber function, and we will talk about that as well. So the Big categories of polyneuropathies include axonal and demyelinating. So like we talked about earlier, axons are those nerve fibers um, running from the neuron down to the next neuron, 
sending messages down the legs. And myelin is the protective sheath around those nerve fibers. So some neuropathies preferentially damage axons while others preferentially damage myelin. And that is important because when myelin is damaged, it can recuperate and heal much, much faster than axons can heal if they were damaged. For example, axon renervation takes place at approximately one inch per month. Um, so if you think about a pinched nerve in your leg causing a foot drop, for example, if the axons are damaged and severely damaged, that can take up to a couple of years to heal. And sometimes the longer the distance that healing has to take place, the more likely that the healing will be incomplete and you may be left with some deficits. Whereas a demyelinating neuropathy, such as, let's say, a mild carpal tunnel at the wrist where only the outer myelin is damaged, um, that can get better on its own relatively quickly. Now, there are some demyelinating neuropathies that we don't have treatment for. They don't get better on their own, and that is um, the big group of inherited polyneuropathies, such as Charcot-Marie Tooth. Another important thing to remember is that axonal neuropathies make up the vast majority of neuropathies out there, while demyelinating neuropathies make up much smaller percentage, and the ones that are not inherited sometimes um, can be treated and are potentially reversible. So this is very important to make this, um, distingu to distinguish the two because we don't want to miss any potentially treatable or reversible neuropathies. So like we talked about, the very few cases of um, demyelinating polyneuropathy uh, out there in general. So some of them include something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. Guillain-Barre syndrome is a, it's basically an inappropriate immune response that your body um, forms after it can, it varies, but it tends to be after some kind of viral infection where an immune response is created and it inappropriately affects the myelin of your nerves. And typically it presents with um, what we call ascending. So symptoms start in the, in the legs and kind of work their way up of loss of sensation, numbness, tingling, weakness, um, and inability to walk, clumsiness, falls. And this can happen relatively quickly over the course of a week or so. Sometimes Guillain-Barre can uh, cause some mild weakness in sensory symptoms and it does improve. Other times it can be severe and it can affect your facial strength, your speech, swallowing, and breathing muscles to the point where somebody with Guillain-Barre, who has a more aggressive case, can end up on a ventilator in the ICU for a period of time until we're able to treat it and then allow the body to try and heal those, uh, my, the myelin around the nerves. Now, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy is basically the chronic version of Guillain-Barre, meaning that patients continue to have episodic um, and sometimes progressive weakness and loss of sensation in the arms and legs, but symptoms progress over longer than eight weeks. And this is important because treatment can vary, although it, this is a treatable condition. Uh, paraproteinemias can cause demyelinating neuropathies, and this is if there are abnormal proteins swimming around in your bloodstream, and that can happen as a result of some blood cancers or bone marrow cancers. So this is important to know because of uh, potential treatment impl implications. Some medications, we'll, uh, we'll go over some medications that can cause neuropathy, but some medications can cause demyelinating neuropathies. And again, it's important to know because if we are able to make that 
um, connection, we can discontinue that medication and hope that the nerves improve and heal. And finally, the biggest category of demyelinating polyneuropathies are the hereditary ones, and those are also called charcot marie tooth, although there are very many um, various types of charcot marie tooth neuropathies. So causes of axonal polyneuropathies, they are uh, more of them, more numbers of those. And diabetes and prediabetes or insulin resistance are by far the most common. Um, and these can actually have some demyelinating features depending on the severity of um, the neuropathy. Vitamin B12 deficiencies um, can be potentially treatable a potentially treatable cause of axonal polyneuropathy. Alcoholism and um, some nutritional abnormalities that come along with it can cause axonal polyneuropathy. Vasculitis, so again, um, an inflammatory attack on the blood vessels of the body can cause impaired blood supply and nutrition to the nerves, thereby causing neuropathy changes. Again, paraproteinemias can also cause axonal polyneuropathies. Amyloidosis is a condition in which um, proteins in the body fold abnormally and can attack various different organs. This can be a potentially rapidly progressive and deadly cause of neuropathy because the heart can be affected as well. And there are cases of sporadic amyloidosis, but there are cases of hereditary amyloidosis, and that um, type of amyloidosis actually does have a treatment, um, a medication treatment out there where sporadic amyloidosis is treated a little bit differently if we are successful and are able to treat it at all. Toxic neuropathies, again, medications, different medications can cause neuropathy. Um, there are axonal hereditary neuropathies, and then um, idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause of this neuropathy. Um, it's important to know this because about 50 to 60 percent of the time after we've looked at all the most common causes of neuropathy, we do not find a cause. And I believe that a large majority, a big group of those people do progress to maybe develop some insulin resistance, prediabetes, and their nerves were just much more sensitive and developed symptoms earlier in life. Also, a big percentage of these people can, could be inherited neuropathies or hereditary neuropathies, and it just isn't so obvious um, in the family history, or they are the first ones with that mutation. Um, so I do tell my patients who I see with neuropathy that a lot of times, 50 to 60 percent, we don't find the cause. We're left with uh, um, idiopathic neuropathy, and then we treat the symptoms. The good news about idiopathic neuropathies is that they do not act like typical diabetic neuropathies where people end up having significant risk of ulcers, infection, potential amputation, loss of ambulation. Idiopathic neuropathies do tend to progress. They can be painful. They can cause some imbalance, and maybe uh, individuals will require the use of an assistive device, but they generally tend to maintain their ability to ambulate. So a couple other types of polyneuropathies, uh, and they're, they're broken up into how they present acute or subacute, more chronic, symmetrical, inherited, or uh, asymmetrical, generalized sensory and motor, and then mononeuropathies. And I'll give you some examples of each of these. So subacute and acute generalized polyneuropathies can be sensory motor, so you can have an acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy syndrome. Alcohol or nutritional deficiencies and or toxins can cause this type of picture. More motor than sensory can happen with, like we talked about, Guillain-Barre, porphyria, which is another blood disorder. 
certain toxins like dapsone and vincristine, diphtheria, which is an infection, and acute or subacute sensory neuropathies can happen in the setting of um, HIV, perineoplastic or autoimmune. So perineoplastic means um, due to some kind of malignant process happening in the body causing attack on the nerves. T other toxins uh, like cisplatin or vitamin B6 toxicity can cause a predominantly sensory type of neuropathy. Uh, more slowly progressive, chronic, generalized neuropathies can, um, there are some examples of these, so alcohol, nutritional deficiencies can cause that, some connective tissue diseases, diabetes tends to progress like this, the dysproteinemias or the paraproteinemias like I talked about earlier, uremia, is typically seen if you have impaired kidney function and you're not able to clear out those toxins in your body very easily, they can build up and cause nerve damage. Uh, more motor than sensory is that chronic inflammatory demyelinating poly, uh, polyradiculoneuropathy, so the CIDP, this is a treatable condition. Again, the paraproteinemias, um, hypothyroidism, I do check for this because it's a treatable condition, but thyroid dysfunction more commonly causes uh, actual muscle disease rather than uh, nerve damage. Uh, toxins like amyo amiodarone um, and other things listed here can cause some motor neuropathies. And sensory symptoms, again, happen as a result of some of these conditions listed here. Inherited neuropathies that are generalized, symmetric with sensory and motor involvement are the Charcot-Marie tooth, types 1, 2, 3, and X. X stands for X-linked, meaning um, it is inherited in a specific pattern from mother to son. Familial amyloidosis is that inherited condition we talked about and hereditary predisposition to pressure palsies. This is also um, basically a type of um, inherited neuropathy, and um, it presents with a certain clinical picture, and there is a gene defect that we can test for. Asymmetrical generalized sensory and motor uh, polyneuropathies can be as a result of diabetes, vasculitis, uh, Lyme, sarcoidosis. And then the mononeuropathies where only one nerve is affected are those compression and entrapment neuropathies like in um, carpal tunnel or a pinched nerve behind the elbow called an ulnar neuropathy. Um, the most common one in the lower extremities is called a peroneal neuropathy where the nerve is pinched as it crosses over the outside of the knee and down into the leg. We have a bone on the outside of our knee that that nerve runs over. Diabetes can cause mononeuropathies. In fact, I have patients who are uh, diabetics that have more incidence of carpal tunnel, and that's a risk factor for carpal tunnel. And again, vasculitis on initial presentation can look like a mononeuropathy because that first nerve is the only one affected, but then with time, more patches of nerves can be, become abnormal. So I have a list of some drugs and medications that can cause neuropathy, so that's something that's typically investigated to make sure it, um, that isn't the cause. And by far, the most common um, cause of medication-induced neuropathy is chemotherapy. Unfortunately, um, in order to treat the cancer, this is a side effect that sometimes we have to, um, you know, sacrifice. So there are various different of, uh, medication, chemo medications that can cause a neuropathy. The good news about these medication-induced neuropathies is that typically, although they cause some damage, 
if they are stopped, the damage does not tend to progress or get worse. In some cases, it can get better, but sometimes we're left with what, where we are when we stop the medication. Cardiovascular drugs, um, blood pressure medications, uh, uh, things like that are some causes, although this is much less, less common to be the problem. Certain antibiotics can cause certain types of neuropathies. And I'm sorry, uh, suramin on the bottom here, uh, it's supposed to say a sensory neuropathy. Rheumatologic medications, so immune suppressant medications that are sometimes used for various rheumatologic conditions or other conditions. Some of these I use for some neurological disorders, but um, allopurinol, colchicine, gold, and dimethacin can cause different types of neuropathies. And some miscellaneous medications. So um, uh, phenytoin is a seizure medication. Lovastatin and simvastatin are cholesterol-lowering drugs. I've I've never seen them cause a neuropathy, but um, one of the more common side effects is kind of a muscle inflammation, muscle breakdown that we have to weigh with potential benefits. And that is also an un uncommon thing, but it's something that we need to monitor for. So environmental and industrial toxins also have the potential to cause polyneuropathy. So this is something as part of your initial history. And there's a list of some of these. So next we'll move to diabetic polyneuropathy. Like I said, this is such a big uh, and common cause of polyneuropathy that I wanted to spend a little bit extra time talking specifically about that. So the pathophysiology is not fully understood, and it is believed to be multifactorial. So hyperglycemia can cause elevated blood glucose levels within the nerve cell, and that can affect the integrity of the cell membrane and its repair mechanism, thereby causing nerve damage. There's also belief that direct damage to the blood vessels can cause ischemia or impaired blood flow to the nerve, and so the nerve uh, thereby gets damaged. Some alteration in gene expression um, may be contributing, and there may be a component of autoimmunity causing diabetic neuropathy. Some risk factors for more severe symptoms include poor glycemic control, and that is why I always discuss this with my diabetic polyneuropathy patients. We say, you know, I let them know that, yes, you do have nerve damage, and this is where we are now, but you can prevent more nerve damage from happening in the future if you keep your blood sugars under good and normal control. And that can help down the line in terms of pain control and um, more damage, potential weakness, and ambulatory dysfunction. Advanced age is a risk factor for more severe symptoms. It's a risk factor for more likelihood to develop neuropathy as well. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, the duration of the diabetes, how long you've had it can also um, contribute to more severe symptoms. Tobacco use, because small blood vessels are particularly prone to being damaged when uh, you're, you're a smoker, and so when those small blood vessels are already stressed and not able to get nutrition and to the nerves, you're putting more stress on them. Alcohol use, so alcohol is a neurotoxin, and excessive amounts can lead to nerve damage. And tall height, I imagine this has something to do with the fact that your nerves are longer and it takes longer for them to heal. Um, it takes longer for the nutrients to get to where they need to go, so that might contribute to more severe symptoms. 
There are various types of diabetic neuropathies, but really any type of neuropathy that you can think of can affect diabetics. And some are most commonly seen in diabetes and not in other conditions. So the first one, uh, typically the most common one, is a large fiber neuropathy where sensation is impaired. And it, this is called the glove and stocking type of pattern because the longest nerves in your body are the ones going to the feet and after that are the ones going to your hands. So the longest nerves are affected first and then it works its way up. Um, pain can vary. Tendon reflexes are sometimes normal to absent and motor deficits can also vary. For the majority of patients, they don't have much weakness. Small fiber neuropathies are, if you can remember, mainly pain and temperature sensation that's affected. So they may have some tem temperature dysregulation, a lot of pain. Their reflexes actually tend to be normal, but they're not weak. Proximal motor neuropathies, um, so sensation is not abnormal. They may or may not have some pain reflexes can be impaired, but they do have quite a bit of weakness and um, the shoulder uh, muscles responsible for raising the shoulders and arms, muscles responsible for your hip girdle strength and sitting up out of a chair, lifting your leg up, you know, walking that stride, that can be most affected. Uh, acute mononeuropathies, they, mononeuropathies are individual nerve fibers that are damaged, so those can happen. And depending on which nerve is affected, sensory loss can occur, pain, um, and they can have quite a bit of weakness. So cranial nerve six can cause um, some extraocular eye movement abnormalities, same with cranial nerve three, and that can present in a diabetic as double vision that comes on suddenly. Entrapment neuropathies are those neuropathies we talked about that are also mononeuropathies, but they happen at sites of entrapment, so behind the elbow, in the wrist, and this lateral popliteal region where the nerve runs across the outside of the knee over a bone called the fibula and down into the legs, so at the fibular head it can be entrapped or pinched. Some other complications that can happen as a result of diabetic neuropathy include skin breakdown, progressive ulceration, which can lead to infection and amputations and even death. Um, this is a very serious condition if the neuropathy advances to the point where you're not able to feel anything in your legs um, and that blood supply to the legs being affected makes it hard for you to heal from ulcers, making it hard to fight infections. So what can you do if you are a diabetic? And we touched a little bit about this, but maintaining your blood sugars as normal as possible, maintaining your blood pressures, stopping smoking, limiting your alcohol intake, maintaining a healthy weight, Regular exercise, as long as it's safe and recommended and you don't have any contraindications from cardiac standpoint or, you know, joint abnormalities. Maintaining your triglycerides and cholesterol level. So evaluating a polyneuropathy involves typically blood work. So after we've seen the patient, obtained their history, gotten a physical examination and we have an idea of the pattern of their neuropathy, then we look for causes. Um, why do you have a polyneuropathy? Is there a potentially treatable or reversible cause? So some of these blood tests is what we pursue and it depends. I don't do this for uh, on every person. It really depends on their history and other risk factors, other associated symptoms. 
But most patients, if um, they present with a polyneuropathy, we evaluate for diabetes because it is so, so common to be causing a neuropathy. We look for fasting, uh, complete metabolic panel. Uh, we look for hemoglobin A1C levels and sometimes glucose tolerance tests to see if your blood sugars are elevated. Another thing I typically check for the majority of patients is vitamin B12, and MMA is a marker that goes with that. And the reason being is that although most of us get vitamin B12 in our diet, um, if you're having, if you're consuming a well-balanced regular diet, some of us have trouble absorbing the vitamin, and this is a potentially treatable condition. So that's something I tend to check. Complete blood count, making sure that you don't have any. Uh, unusual um, blood count pattern. We look for thyroid dysfunction. In some individuals, I have to evaluate for inflammatory markers um, and looking for cancer or autoimmune diseases. Um, in some individuals, especially if they're older or have some other risk factors, we check uh, serum electrophoresis and immunofixation. This is a test looking for that abnormal protein in the blood that can be associated with some blood cancers. And finally, some individuals, um, specifically in the group where we don't find another cause and they have characteristics or a family history, sometimes we can pursue genetic testing. Another thing we do when individuals present with a polyneuropathy is that we check electrodiagnostic testing, and that consists of nerve conduction studies. So we place stickers over the belly of a muscle. This is a muscle in the hand, and then we stimulate the nerve going to that muscle. We record the response over the muscle, and it tells me how fast that fiber is firing. Um, is it normal? Is it pinched anywhere? So it gives me information about, is this an axonal neuropathy or a demyelinating? And it leads us down the appropriate path for workup and for potential treatment. The second part of electrodiagnostic testing involves electromyography. And this involves a small needle that we place into different muscles of your body, um, typically starting in the hand, then we work our way up and sometimes have to go up the arm, or starting in the foot, working our way up the leg, sometimes checking muscles in the hip, buttock area, sometimes in the low back or up the back area. I listen to those muscles and it gives me information about not only the muscle itself, but also the nerve going to the muscle. So again, it helps us discern how much, if any, a nerve damage there has been. And some individuals require uh, other evaluations. Not everybody requires this, but autonomic testing, which unfortunately we don't have the capabilities here um, in central Iowa even. I believe that in Iowa City they do have some of these tests, but Mayo has a dedicated autonomic lab. So if needed, this is uh, somewhere I would send these patients. But autonomic testing tests for that automatic nervous system like we talked about earlier. And sometimes it involves breathing tests, which um, measure your heart rate response to breathing to see if that's appropriate. Tilt table testing involves putting you on a table and um, putting straps down so that you're secured and slowly raising the table up while measuring your blood pressure and heart rate as we come up. And we're looking for abnormal responses um, to that automatic nervous system. So you should have a gradual, nice, um, nice uh, gradual change in your blood pressure as you get set, set up and it shouldn't be a drastic drop or rise, but some of these individuals have some changes that can be abnormal. Gastrointestinal testing, so they'll check um, how fast your gut is emptying. Are those nerves going to the gut working right? Quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex testing uh, tests um, the sweating pattern um, of 
basically they send a message to nearby fibers and check if that message is taken up by uh, appropriately. Thermoregulatory sweat tests involves um, basically they cover you in a powder and put you in a room where the temperature slowly gets increased and the goal is to get you sweating and then they're able to see where are you sweating and if there are areas where you don't sweat that is consistent with uh, certain patterns that can help us determine what kind of neuropathy you may have. Bladder function is also tested and um, autonomic reflexes, uh, reflex testing. And lastly, sometimes we have to pursue nerve or skin biopsies, sometimes even muscle biopsies, depending on the type of neuropathy. Um, nerve and muscle biopsies are very rarely pursued, but they tend to be um, for conditions where treatment would be changed as a result of this test. And usually this happens if you have a vasculitic type of neuropathy. Skin biopsies are very helpful in helping us determine if somebody has a small fiber neuropathy because they take a sample of your skin and look under the microscope to see what the density of those small fibers is. And if it's below a threshold, that can be diagnostic. Sometimes we have to pursue imaging tests like CTs and MRIs because nerves can be pinched up higher around the neck, around the back. Next are treatment options. So usually, for the majority of patients, there isn't anything to treat or reverse or cure neuropathy. But we do have medications that can help manage their symptoms, specifically the positive symptoms, the burning, prickling, pain, sharp, stabbing. None of these medications work very well to help the negative symptoms, and that is something we have to keep in mind, and I. I want, I, I'm honest with my patients about not to expect that the numbness will get better, but if the pain is there, these medications can be very helpful. And they include things like gabapentin, pregabalin, which is Lyrica, amitriptyline or nortriptyline, duloxetine, which is an antidepressant, lidocaine patches, sometimes on the feet, or capsaicin cream, which is um, applied topically. Sometimes certain neuropathies require immune, uh, immune um, medications, such as steroids, IVIG, which is an infusion of pooled antibodies, and plasmapheresis, which is essentially blood washing of those antibodies that may be causing damage to the nerves, and rituximab, which is uh, sometimes used in certain types of rheumatologic diseases or cancers. And other treatments are those vitamin uh, deficiency neuropathies, which are treated by replacing those vitamins. Okay, so I have three cases, uh, maybe it's four, cases that I'd like to go through with you quickly, just so you have an idea of the thought process. And then we'll go to questions. If we still have time, I think we should. So. My first patient is a 36-year-old female. She presents with subacute distal upper and lower extremity paresthesias, which is the term for a numbness and tingling. Symptoms progressed to weakness, ataxia, which means um, uncoordination or unsteadiness, and eventually she started to develop falls. Her examination consisted of impaired vibration and position sense in the distal lower extremities, which means the far lower extremities in the feet. She had decreased pinprick in the hands and feet, weakness in the lower extremities more than the upper extremities, and increased tone throughout, meaning that um, her muscles were um, more stiff, essentially as well as hyperreflexia, meaning her reflexes were very increased. She had a wide-based and unsteady and uncoordinated gait. So we did get pictures of her spine with an MRI. We looked at her cervical and thoracic spine, and there was an abnormal signal down the 
posterior portion of her spinal cord. When we did electrical testing, it was actually normal, but labs found that her vitamin B12 was very low and MMA was elevated. So in this condition, the treatment was to replace her vitamin B12 with injections, and later she required oral supplementation. Her symptoms completely resolved within a few weeks. This is a condition called subacute combined degeneration due to vitamin B12 deficiency. So vitamin B12 deficiency does not only cause a peripheral neuropathy, but central, meaning brain or spinal cord, changes to the nerves can also happen. And this is a treatable condition. Next, we have a 67-year-old gentleman who presented with slowly progressive painful paresthesias in the distal lower extremities over the course of two years. He has a past medical history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, and was recently diagnosed um, with diabetes mellitus. His um, hemoglobin A1C was 9%, so it, it was... Um, poorly controlled by the time we got the A1C. On exam, his strength was normal. His reflexes were absent. He had decreased pinprick and temperature sensation at the ankles and impaired vibration and position sense. His gait was somewhat unsteady because he had pain in his feet when he walked. Electrical testing did reveal a symmetrical, length-dependent axonal sensory motor peripheral polyneuropathy. Other blood work was obtained in his vitamin B12, serum immunofixation and electrophoresis, complete metabolic panel, complete blood cell count. Um, they were all largely unremarkable with the exception of an elevated fasting blood sugar. He was started on gabapentin, 100 milligrams at night, and gradually titrated up to 600 milligrams three times a day. He worked with his PCP, diabetic educators and dietitians, and his blood sugars gradually improved. Three months later, his hemoglobin A1C was 7%. His painful paresthesias improved, but he continued to have some loss of sensation in his legs and had to be cautious with his gait to make sure he didn't fall. So this is a painful diabetic peripheral polyneuropathy. It's a classical type of presentation. So next is a 45-year-old female who presented with one week of progressive ascending paresthesias and leg weakness. She experienced a gastrointestinal illness approximately three weeks ago. Um, exam did reveal that she was very weak. She had difficulty appreciating sensation in the upper and lower extremities, and her reflexes were unresponsive throughout. Electrical testing only revealed some mild slowing of the nerves tested and absent H reflexes, which is basically a response that checks the message going from the foot all the way into the spine and back. Labs were normal with the exception of elevated protein in the spinal fluid, and this is called an albuminocytological dissociation. She was treated with five days of IVIG. She required intensive inpatient therapy, but regained her strength and sensation over the course of a couple of months. It took quite some time. This is Guillain-Barre syndrome, and sometimes early in the course, the electrical testing is only minimally abnormal or even normal, um, but other features are able to help us make this diagnosis. Okay, so I only included three cases, and we're right at time, so we'll go to questions if anybody has any. Okay, very good question. Oh, yes. Um, with COVID-19, is there any neuropathy effect? So very good question. Um, right now, what, what we know is that Actually, there have been some reports of Guillain-Barre type of presentation after COVID-19 infection. Um, it, it isn't a very common thing, fortunately, but it, it is something that the teams caring for severely ill patients are looking for if there's a great degree of weakness with presentation or, you know, 
if somebody was sick with COVID and a few weeks later developed some abnormal sensation and weakness and trouble walking and things came on pretty quickly, that's something that we would have to evaluate for. Chronic painful neuropathies, I have not seen it yet, but of course it's six months in, so more information might come out down the line. We don't know what the long-term effects of COVID-19 infection are. Other questions? Okay, thank you all so much. All right, have a good day. And I'll zip in there quickly okay, and tell them yeah. goodbye. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ramich. Um, lots of great information. So I'm wondering, how does a, I believe they're calling our storm a derrico that we had yesterday. It wasn't a tornado, it was straight winds called a derrico. <laughs> So how does that affect, no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. All these new things we have going on in 2020, it's um, a lot for everybody to deal with. So again, thank you. As a reminder every, to everyone, our um, next program is Wednesday, August 19th, and the program is on mindful eating. So thank you for joining for us. Stay safe out there, everyone, and have a great day. Goodbye.